Okay, just kind of taking you home here. Uh, so many of you know that uh, Lynn just uh, took her board examination. And uh, you know, sometimes they ask these really crazy questions like on your board examinations, like what's the pox next door? And then, <laughs> so what do Casanova, Idi Amin, and uh, Beethoven, and uh, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, and at least my clinic, the church lady, have in common? <laughs> So they're all at risk for syphilis. And each one of these people had syphilis. So I want to talk to you a little bit about syphilis. The, um, it's a very prevalent disease, uh, 18 million cases in 2002 uh, in the World Health Organization, uh, and 5.6 prevalent, uh, rather incident cases. But 90% of these are in the developing world. And the United States, um, since They've been keeping records of this in the 40s. There's, uh, there was a very high percentage of uh, cases, and which has slowly decreased, decreased, decreased to a uh, with a little blip in the 90s uh, around the uh, HIV/AIDS epidemic, and then an all-time low in 2000, only to see this resurgence uh, with both an increase, uh, 17 or 18 percent increase in primary and secondary cases, and uh, also in congenital cases since 2000, the year 2000. Uh, there have been discrete epidemics of uh, syphilis in the Pacific Northwest uh, and in San Francisco. Um, there is no formal reporting system in the United States. However, there is in the United Kingdom. And it's interesting, there is not very many cases of syphilitic uveitis that are reported as compared to the number of cases of systemic syphilis. And calling the literature in the United States, it represents about 1 to 5 percent of uveitic cases that we see in a tertiary care setting. The thing is that there is a real, the, uh, HIV and syphilis travel together. So there's a very high rate of co-infection of these two organisms. So, you know, if you have, a co you have patients that are HIV positive, there's a 20% chance that you may have ocular involvement. And then conversely, um, syphilis uh, can be predictive of HIV co-infection. So always test for both uh, when you suspect either one in a patient. Um, acquired syphilis uh, is divided into three stages. And uh, the primary lesion is the, uh, the uh, chancre, uh, which occurs two to six weeks um, after a abrasion of the mucous membrane, followed by second, the secondary stage of syphilis six to eight weeks later following hematogenous spread of the organisms uh, throughout the body, the lymph nodes, and into the central nervous system. And then this is followed by a variable degree of uh, tertiary syphilis, uh, either early, late, or latent. You have to know that, that uveitis can occur in any stage of this disease. Um, and it is called the great masquerader because it can produce pretty much anything and affect um, any, uh, any area of the eye. Uh, but about 50% of the time, it presents as a posterior uveitis. So that's what we're talking about today. And there are certain cl clinical presentations that are virtually pathognomonic of syphilis. The first is an acute syphilitic <coughs> posterior placoid retinitis. It's a mouthful. Um, and this were, presents as a uniform circular oval outer choroidal uh, lesion. Uh, and uh, the typical patient is male, HIV positive, in about a third of the, third of the cases. And this is representative example. One can see this circular placoid lesion at the level of the RPE and choroid. And on fluorescein angiography, um, it shows this kind of leopard spotting in the early stage of the angiogram with uh, blocked fluorescence and then blocked fluorescence at the leading edge of this lesion, which stains uh, and leaks a little bit later in the later stages of the, um, of the angiogram. The same patient I, I underwent ICG angiography, and I, ICG angiography shows, although not specific, can be highly suggestive of this disease with a uniform hypofluorescence in the early and late phases of uh, the angiogram as seen here. And this can actually be helpful in certain cases that are very subtle that present in this placoid uh, lesion, as I'll show you uh, in a minute. Um, the uh, OCT of this is also quite helpful, and it shows discontinuity of the outer segment ellipsoid uh, with irregular nodular hyperreflectivity uh, at the level of the uh, RPE, and sometimes subretinal fluid uh, and um, uh, extra external limiting membrane um, disruption. The other distinctive uh, presentation is a panuveitis with superficial 
uh, pre-retinal ex exudates. So these are not in the retina, they are just pre-retinal, they're small creamy white uh, lesions that, mi that seem to be migratory and may actually be, are frequently over vessels and may be associated with some uh, syphilitic retinitis which is typically uh, mild opacification of the retina and heals without disruption of the pigment epithelium or ne necrosis of the retina as, as Akbar had just described with uh, acute retinal necrosis or necrotizing herpetic retinopathy. And this is seen here in both a patient with, with that's HIV positive and a patient that's HIV negative with these precipitates here that seem to follow blood vessels. The thing about these precipitates uh, is it's thought to be related to vasculitis and they disappear promptly with treatment. Uh, another mode of presentation is really just strictly with optic nerve involvement. This is a gentleman, a 57-year-old patient of mine that presented uh, with sores on his hands and his mouth and his tongue. That was a big tip-off as to you know what was going on with him and indeed he was uh, RPR and FTA positive and I uh, showed this hemorrhage around his disc and hyperfluorescence of his optic nerve so there has been a description of a syphilitic outer retinopathy that was uh, described this is actually a patient of mine that came in with these curvilinear uh, lesions here uh, that were initially described and thought to be azor, but it turns out that the patient, many of these patients were RPR positive, so syphilis was the diagnosis. And if you look really carefully in these areas, there really is a placoid lesion, and so it's thought that these uh, area, this syphilitic outer retinopathy is really a variant, a subtle variant of the um, uh, placoid uh, chorea retinopathy, and ICG can be helpful in that. Post-treatment, complete uh, revision uh, and, and return to normality in this particular patient. This patient presented three years later, okay, with profound reduction in vision and pan uveitis, as you can see here, okay? So patients with syphilis can become reinfected. So that is always something uh, to keep in mind. And this, this patient was, uh, had a uh, RPR that was positive. He was treated, but unfortunately his vision did not recover. Uh, although his fundoscopic appearance was improved. So syphilis is a clinical diagnosis, always consider it in your workup of patients uh, with uveitis. There's a highly variable presentation, but there are distinctive posterior pole presentations that should make you think of the diagnosis. Always inquire about other sexually transmitted diseases, and uh, in the workup, one must always uh, order specific uh, serological testing. So traditionally, we've ordered both non-treponemal and treponemal tests, the RPR and the FTA, ABS together. As you know, the um, RPR um, is, uh, is positive in the initial stages of the, of the infection and can wane in tertiary syphilis and with treatment, whereas the FTA remains positive for life. The uh, CDC has uh, recently recommended a so-called reverse sequence testing in which uh, Enzyme uh, immunoassays and chemoluminescent assays are used to screen for patients with toxoplasma with uh, syphilis as they, they have increased sensitivity and specificity as a screening test. And then the RPR is used to follow the treatment response. So in the case of a patient that is um, EIA uh, positive and RPR negative, which can happen, then there's kind of a tiebreaker of a very highly specific and sensitive test called the treponemal pallidum particle agglutination test, which is like a tiebreaker, which would confirm the diagnosis of uh, syphilis. Um, further testing, uh, as I said, always test for HIV in a patient with syphilis and vice versa, but patients with um, syphilis, ocular syphilis, are thought to have neurosyphilis, so the CDC recommends that these patients um, undergo a lumbar puncture and that they have a repeat lumbar, pun lumbar puncture if they are positive um, six months later. Um, the uh, treatment for syphilis is not with a shot of penicillin in the butt, okay? It is a uh, neurosyphilitic uh, uh, regimen with intravenous uh, benzathine penicillin for 10 to 14 days or desensitization in a penicillin uh, allergic patient or procaine penicillin with probenicid. <coughs> Uh, corticosteroids can be useful for uh, uh, patients with anterior segment inflammation, but very frequently uh, patients with, depending upon the degree of inflammation in the back of the eye, will respond to antibiotic treatment alone. That being said, uh, another board type question is that um, after or during treatment, uh, one can develop a severe inflammatory, systemic inflammatory reaction and ocular inflammatory reaction known as the Yarrick's. Rixheimer uh, response in which steroids are definitely indicated 
and can be preventative. Uh, also, one would consider systemic steroids in a patient with, with structural complications and severe inflammation. So in summary, always think about syphilis. In every, if I had to order one test okay, for syphilis, it would be an FTA, um, because you can actually treat it and cure it. Um, there are certain, it can affect any time anatomic region in the eye, but there are certain distinctive presentations that should uh, really make you think about the diagnosis. Serologic testing is imperative, as is uh, uh, lumbar puncture in patients with ocular disease. Um, a multimodal imaging can be helpful, and the treatment is always with a neuro neurological dosing. Uh, and the visual outcomes are generally pretty good. Um, uh, and there doesn't really seem to be a, uh, it was previously reported that HIV pa positive patients did more poorly, but recent evidence suggests that uh, they're about the same as patients that are HIV negative. So that's it. syphilis, do you, we don't have a whole lot more time, but I'd be happy to entertain any questions about the Grand Rounds presentation. Roger. Very nice, Alan. Do you have any, any pushback from the health department about FTA? At one point, you had to get an RPR first before they would let you do an FTA. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, there, it, there was that there was actually pushback at AREP, but most of the ID people here, you know, uh, don't. First of all, the ID department does not use the reverse sequence testing regularly, and they always order the two tests together. It's imperative that the two are ordered together. Right. So we did, but you know, we have a conversation with them and try to re-educate them about what ocular syphilis is about. All right. Yes, Ashley. <clears throat> so Dr. Larchelle talked about the, the study showing that there was less reoccurrence with, um, with toxo if you use back for memory the other day. Is that something that you guys practice here or? Yeah, we do. So for, um, so the biggest studies that I know about are, you know, those ones in Brazil in which uh, the effect lasted for as long as pe people were on prophylactic Bactrim, and, and they actually have 10-year follow-up on that. And uh, you know the effect lasted while they're on the medication, but then the, the recurrence rates seem to recur after they're off of, off of Bactrim three times a day. Pretty benign. Uh, there are 10% sulfa allergy in Bactrim you have to be aware of. Uh, we do, I do routinely prophylax patients for uh, with Bactrim um, who have lesions that particularly uh, in monocular patients with uh, lesions that are vision threatening close to the fovea, which many of them are, uh, or to the optic nerve. Um, the other thing is that uh, there is one study that I'm aware of in which um, treating, so the biggest risk for a reactivation of toxoplasmosis is a previous infection with toxoplasmosis temporally. So if you've had a recent infection, you're more apt to have a recurrent infection, which is one of the rationales for treating patients with toxoplasmosis. The other, th the other thing is pathophysiologically, uh, it, it is thought that the, the organisms are, are assisted throughout the retina, not just in the scars. Okay? Um, and that uh, for cataract surgery, there's one uh, uh, study that suggests that prophylactically treating patients before and after cataract surgery will reduce the rate of recurrence in the perioperative period for, um, for cataract surgery, just as with uh, you know, viral, with herpes. Is that period of treatment, is that full dose back room? Yeah, so, you know, I would give him back room twice a day for a week, pre-operative and, and post-operative.